Five Deadly Rebels, a Kung Fu sci-fi novel, volume one of five, written and narrated by Ian Twasen. Music by Wu-Tang Clan producer Silver Rings. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom, that him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. The Book of Revelations, 13, verses 17 to 18. Chapter 1 The King of Manhattan The slugger pinches the pink bill of his baseball cap and pulls it down lower over the pink-plated iron mask hiding his face, lined with horizontal slits. Yet no one in the packed nightclub is giving him a second look. Or rather, no one's daring to. They only sneak quick glances from the corners of their eyes as he pours Moet and Cristal down the throats of barely covered college girls and Instagram models, filling up his VIP booth, tilting their heads back with mouths wide open like baby birds waiting to be fed every time he raises a bottle. The slugger surveys the club from the edge of the booth as if measuring the place up to his standards. His pink alpaca wool overshirt hangs open exposing a dark silver chain encrusted with pink diamonds, drooping heavy over his pink silk t-shirt, stretching across his massive chest. Dangling from the chain swings a crypto ledger, thinly plated with 24 karat pure gold. Gold that isn't even a fraction of a fraction of the wealth that the ledger itself could unlock. Life-changing wealth, not for one life, but for billions. This is the kind of outlandish wealth that dangles casually around his thick neck, and only four others know this. The Roland Ten's Harlem Crips have their own booth on the other side of the club, trying not to mad dog in the slugger's direction, showing him respect, even though he gunned down seven of their members two weeks before in broad daylight, just for selling blow in Greenwich Village, where he runs things now. Everyone who is anyone knows that the slugger was shot 89 times in 11 different incidents. And he didn't die. He didn't even bleed. Word got around Manhattan that taking a shot at the slugger meant death. And since then, no one has ever tried. Even the huge bouncers at the club didn't dare frisk him when he first entered, despite noticing his rose, gold-plated Desert Eagle pistol tucked heavy in his front waistband for all to see. But the slugger wasn't always this feared, this known. He was a young baseball prodigy in the Dominican Republic just a few years ago when an American scout sponsored him on a student visa to live with his family in Soho while he attended and played ball for one of the top private high schools in Manhattan. He left his small rural town at the edge of a jungle and got his first taste of America and its promises. Colleges like Duke and Stanford courted him. Even some big league teams mailed him offers to play in their farm system. But during a standard practice with his high school team, the ligaments in his shoulder were torn to shreds on a routine throw to first base, and in that split second of unbearable pain, all his dreams were torn too. When recalling that day, he wasn't sure what hurt worse, his shoulder or his hopes. After that, the scout who discovered him focused more on other kids, and the slugger moved in with his teammate Caesar, also Dominican but American-born, living in a humble two-bedroom apartment on the Lower East Side with his immigrant parents and two younger sisters. The slugger rode the bench for the rest of the school year, his shoulder still aching and wrapped in tension bands. The offers from colleges stopped coming, but he was happy just watching Caesar from the bench, cheering for him, rooting for him. Caesar had a decent chance to make it to the big leagues one day, 
the slugger would always tell him. On the second last day of school, a week away from graduation, the slugger and Caesar walked home wearing their blue team jerseys and debated which of the colleges that offered him scholarships had the prettiest girls. This is when a black Nissan filled with four members of the Nine Trey Bloods sprayed bullets at them from a fully automatic Uzi just because they were wearing blue. Caesar was hit twice in the back, but none hit the slugger. Caesar died lying face down on the sidewalk as the screeching of tires faded off into the distance, the slugger crouching over Caesar's body, shaking him to wake up. Come here, papi. A petite blonde in a skin-tight vinyl dress creeps in front of the slugger and grinds her Brazilian butt lift on his crotch, twerking, bumping against the hard nozzle of his desert eagle, bulging out from under his white denim jeans. She turns around and kisses the slugger's mask, leaving a red lipstick stamp on pink iron. Under the mask, a white balaclava of Egyptian cotton, littered with black embroidered five-tally symbols, hugs his wide head and neck. Standing there, in the pounding bass from the speaker towers guarding every corner of the club, sending pulses of reverb through the sweat-damp air and clouds of dry ice, he pauses to wonder if Caesar's parents made use of the fifty grand in cash he had delivered to their apartment in an unmarked box with no return address, or whether they just gave the money away to some charity or their church. The last time he knocked on their door and offered them eleven grand in a wad of hundreds, they refused it, knowing who he was now, who he'd become. But the slugger could never get them out of his mind. How the hard-working immigrant couple let him live with them for months after Caesar died, as he took the time to figure out what to do with the rest of his life. That summer, while living with them, he would walk the streets to his part-time job at a bodega around the corner, strolling past Trinitarios, loitering the streets repping green, Grape Street Crips repping purple, Hoover's repping orange, and so many others he couldn't remember and so he only wore pink that summer, day after day, only pink. He was a ghost in the neighborhood, a ghost to the baseball scouts that once showered him with promises of fame. And every day he watched the gangbangers with iced-up chains driving by in their BMWs and Benzes and saw how everyone respected them, even civilians. The owner of the Jewish deli down the street that one vice lord gangster cut to the front of the line while he waited at the back of it, his hands clasping tight into fists inside the pouch of his pink hoodie, so tight that his knuckles turned white. But that's in the past now. Now he's a Lower East Side legend. He's the slugger from 10th Street who can't be killed. No one fucks with him now. It was only a matter of time that the other four boroughs got word that the slugger ran things in Manhattan. It was only a matter of time that the other four rebels would get word of him. He knows that wearing the mask that makes him impervious to bullets and blades also exposes him to dangers far greater. But he doesn't care. He's the king of Manhattan now. He's somebody. He's gang now. One gang. And his anonymity, his true anonymity, is the price he paid for it. Lambos, raris, and other luxury whips line both sides of the long lane in the deep underground parking lot. The slugger struts down the center of the lane with two bottle service girls from the club, one under each arm, their short mini dresses riding up their bare butt cheeks, laughing at everything the slugger says. They pass under rows and rows of fluorescent lights, some of them flickering, all of them barely lighting the dark expanse of space. Every little sound they make, like their footsteps and laughter, echoes loudly off the cement walls and ceilings, enclosing them like a vast cavern. Their laughter stops short when a lone figure steps out from between two Audis and blocks the path ahead of them. The figure stands a full foot shorter than the slugger, wearing a black leather vest over a flowing blue hakama, cloaking the figure's slender frame. A pointed metallic jingaza hangs low on the figure's head. 
its broad blue and black strap fastened firmly under the figure's mouth, running up the sides of the figure's cheeks and ears. A black skin-tight cowl, embroidered with tiny white insect designs, shrouds the figure's entire head, eyes hidden behind tinted shades. The slugger recognizes the figure instantly. The samurai, number two. The slugger stops in his tracks and the girls stop with him. An eerie silence watches over everything. The long black hilt of overdark, the samurai's katana, points menacingly upwards at the samurai's side, its curved blade sheathed in a scabbard painted with black and white Japanese-style clouds swirling up and down its wood. You chicas best fly, the slugger says, patting the girls on their butts. They take each other's hands and scan her away, glancing sideways at the samurai as the clamping of their stilettos echo even louder in the now silent garage. Number two, way, eh? Wouldn't have guessed it'd be you. The slugger lowers his head. He pulls open one side of his overshirt, unveiling the handle of his desert eagle, peeking out from over his waistband. The headlights of the cars lining each side of the wide lane seems to stare at the pair of them, like spectators of a medieval joust about to happen. Better time than any, I guess, he whispers, more to himself than to the samurai. In a flash, the slugger draws the four-pound pistol with one hand, and like a synchronized dance, the samurai draws over dark at the same instant, jagged electric bolts crackling up and down its shiny blade. Two cars on opposite sides of the lane start sliding slowly towards the samurai, tires screeching. The slugger unloads all nine rounds at the samurai, his bulky arm never budging from the gun's strong kickback. But all nine slugs curve in the air towards Overdark's blade, collecting the slugs like pellets on a magnet. The samurai swipes the sword downwards and the slugs clatter on the pavement like marbles. Tossing the desert eagle aside, the slugger charges at the samurai with a speed impossible for his large frame and throws an overhead haymaker down at the samurai, who leaps over the deadly blow. The slugger's fist plummets into the pavement where the samurai once stood just a split second earlier, shattering the pavement like a pile driver, asphalt exploding into chunks, big and small. The impact blasts a wave of reverberation, setting off all the car alarms in the garage, horns honking and headlights flashing all around them. Still airborne, the samurai swings over dark down onto the slugger's shoulder. Steel cuts through wool and silk but halts dead on unbreakable skin, sending a jolt up through the samurai's arms. The slugger catches the samurai midair with one hooked arm, and with a technically perfect judo hip throw, he sends the samurai crashing into the back of a Lincoln SUV, shattering its back windshield. The samurai slides down the dented tailgate and slinks onto the ground, dazed, still gripping over dark with one shaky hand. I don't know what master told you, Chico, but I ain't got no weak spot. The slugger bends down to take hold of the samurai, who thrusts over dark straight into his belly, penetrating through nothing, as if stabbing into a brick wall. And then the samurai is airborne again, thrashing into the front of a Land Rover bending its grill in half, loose screws scattering everywhere. The slugger charges again, but the samurai springs up and brings Overdark down in a wide arc at the slugger's face, who blocks the strike with crossed forearms. Razor-edged steel stops short just inches from his iron mask, but the sword's electric bolts reach out from its blade and crackle around the slugger's mask like jagged blue fingers. The electricity rips the mask from his face and clashes onto Overdark with a loud metallic clank. Unveiling the slugger's dark eyes, mocha skin, and thick nose through the round opening in his white balaclava. The samurai yanks Overdark back, the iron mask still stuck to its steel, and sweeps the sword wide, aiming for the side of the slugger's head. The slugger dodges backwards, blindingly quick but not quick enough. No, 
The slugger shrieks as the razor tip of Overdark slices the bridge of his nose, opening up skin and cartilage, exposing its whiteness. The slugger stumbles backwards, his posture softening. The injury itself isn't serious, a flesh wound, but the implications are grave. And both the slugger and the samurai know what it truly means. Dragging one leg back into a wide kendo stance, the samurai jerks Overdark to the side, and the iron mask clatters and slides across asphalt. In a blinding spark, the samurai darts forward with a dizzying array of strikes, downwards, upward, side to side, lightning fast, and the slugger, no longer willing to block the blows, dips and dodges the blade, backpedaling faster and faster until he's cornered at the front end of his own pink Bugatti. The samurai thrusts over dark straight at the slugger, who parries to the side, but the steel catches his shoulder, slicing through wool, skin, and muscle. Blood pours down his limp arm, dripping from the tips of his fingers and onto the pavement like drops of red paint. With his good arm, the slugger fires a wild left hook at the samurai's head, but the samurai drops under it, legs spread wide into a half-split, and runs the katana blade across the slugger's belly, cutting through his t-shirt, his skin, his abdominal muscles, his guts, from one side of his stomach to the other. Black bile and blood pour out of his open belly. Intestines fall out, hanging like curtains. Hmm. The slugger stops. The samurai, legs still open wide, one hand flat on the pavement, the other holding overdark parallel to the ground, head lowered, unmoving, not even looking up at the damage done. The slugger pauses as if there was nothing else to do. Taking two steps back, he sits on the hood of his Bugatti, his weight compressing the front wheel shocks, lowering its fender until it touches the ground. He digs out a long pre-rolled blunt and a two-dollar disposable lighter from the front pocket of his overshirt and lights the blunt, drawing in a deep drag of smoke, his guts still hanging out. He drops the lighter back into his pocket as if he was going to use it again later as if there would be a later. A pool of blood forms at his feet. It ain't never gonna be enough for us, will it? The slugger says. The shorter samurai rises up, now eye level with the slugger sitting down. He doesn't even react when the samurai rips off his chain, tearing the collar of his t-shirt open, exposing his hairy chest. The gold-plated crypto ledger hangs from one link of the chain. The samurai eyes the ledger for a few moments, mesmerized. The slugger starts to sing an old Spanish folk song, offbeat to the honking of car alarms. The samurai looks down at the slugger's bare chest and the two words tattooed on it, one word under each collarbone. Iron. Fame. The slugger tries to raise his blunt to his lips, but the strength drains from his arm. He lowers his chin to his chest and closes his eyes. The samurai is gone now. The slugger sits alone, his singing fading into mumbling. Only the blaring car alarms filling the air keep him company as he lets the life inside him drain away. Chapter 2 The Five Chambers Straggling along the narrow girder beam running across the underside of George Washington Bridge, Mickey keeps his arms spread out like wings for balance, suspended over the dark waters of Hudson River 25 stories below. He'd only bring one hand in every now and then to take a swig from the bottle of Jamaican rum in his grip not his preference of booze, but all that he could find that afternoon. Cars rumble overhead, shaking the steel beam at his feet, forcing him to look down at the river so far underneath him 
that the roar of its waves are silenced by the distance. The seagulls flying close to the water look like passing specks of dust. Mickey knows he's just a misstep, a slip, or a stumble away from certain death. If the impact doesn't kill him, he knows that drowning will. Yet he feels no fear. He never does when he's drunk. He's wearing all black, black air forces, black cargo pants, black hoodie, and a black newsboy cap covering his blonde stubbled head. Its short bill tilted low over his different colored eyes, one gray and one blue. This is his first time outside the boundaries of New York City. Looking back at the city's skyline, he thinks it's the biggest thing he's ever seen in his life. He chugs what's left of the rum and lets the empty bottle fall from his fingers, watching the bottle shrink smaller and smaller into the distance, and then disappear, too far to spot, lost within the expansive backdrop of the vast waters below, as if vanishing from existence. Or maybe it did vanish, Mickey thinks to himself, not shatter on the surface of the waves or plunge into the dark water, but simply vanish, and who can know for sure, he wonders. There are no boats below to witness its demise, no seagulls that have since flown away. The only way to be sure, really, he thinks, is to step off the steel beam and let gravity take him, and then, maybe, he'll know what it'd feel like to be free, free from the daily grind of stealing to survive, free from the memories of his mom and from the broken dreams she left behind. He wonders calmly, his curiosity overpowering his senses, and then he understands for the first time what that phrase he had always heard but never gave much thought to actually meant. Curiosity killed the cat. And so he steps closer over the edge of the beam, his toes and the arches of his feet hanging over it. Only his heels gripping steel as a passing rig above shakes the beam violently. He wouldn't mind, really, he thinks to himself. But then he remembers why he's there and where he's going. And so he steals himself for what's to come. And after all, he's got more drinking to do. The quiet streets of Bergen County, New Jersey, make Mickey feel uneasy. He's used to the city sounds in the Bronx with its cars honking, garbage trucks beeping, people yelling, even in the late hours of the night. Here, there's only the humming of insects and the rustling of leaves from the trees that line the clean, empty streets. The streetlights cast a warm glow over freshly cut lawns and manicured hedges of the houses there, all polished and pristine, a sharp contrast to the water-stained, run-down buildings in South Bronx. The occasional car would drive by, slicing through the silence, forcing Mickey to jump behind a tree, but then the silence would return and hang around even longer. Too quiet, Mickey thinks to himself. In the Bronx, he would squat low on fire escape platforms, peeking into apartment windows with no lights on, waiting for a screaming fire truck or ambulance to blare by before shattering a window. Mickey would steal jewelry, laptops, baseball cards encased in glass, anything he could sell to buy booze and food. On lucky days, there was already booze in the apartments he broke into, and on the luckiest of days, that booze would be Jameson Irish whiskey, beside a bucket of fried chicken or a box of half-eaten pepperoni pizza, left out on the kitchen counter like some kind of bonus that God owed him. Mickey never really enjoyed breaking into homes, just a means to an end, really. Mickey was a simple young man, a good buzz and a full belly were enough to keep him content. But his joy, his true joy, what he really loved to do, was smacking his knuckles into the smug faces of the rich yuppies from Riverdale or the frat boys from Fordham University, the ones who would grimace at, snicker at, and at times even step over street kids like him, sleeping on top of subway grates for warmth. Oi, the fuck you laughing at, broski? Mickey yelled in his thick Irish accent at the three university football players throwing quarters at Carl asleep on the sidewalk under a folded sheet of cardboard. Mickey lost the fight that day, like he almost always does, too drunk to see what his fists are aiming for. But he did get one lucky punch in before crumpling onto the sidewalk from a kick to his gut. 
It was a clean punch that broke the university kid's nose, and he laughed through bloody teeth while the two other friends stomped on his ribs. But it was all worth it to Mickey. Just recalling the feeling of the kid's nose crunch and go soft under his fist gave him shivers of satisfaction. When a douchebag was smaller than him, though, he would just let them go with a scare, like the scrawny businessman in his pressed suit who had the balls to tell Wasi to get a job. The little man didn't even hesitate to run away when Mickey rose up to march at him. Fighting wasn't anything new for Mickey. It wasn't a curse forced upon him by poverty or hard times. In middle school, when everything was good, when him and his mom were taken care of, he was expelled five times for fighting classmates. He made fun of me accent. He told his mom one of those times, and she forgave him, as she always did. But then there were more fights, and more reasons. Eventually, Mickey's mom decided to homeschool him, which thickened his Irish accent, making it even heavier, year after year. Mickey's mom was born and raised in the Belfast ghetto of Northern Ireland. She ran away from her abusive father and couldn't give a shit mother when she was 15, not much younger than Mickey is now. His mom's hair was naturally red, not ginger, but red, like blood. She found work webcamming in a house in Dublin shared by 13 other teenage girls. That's where she met a man who lived in New Jersey. He tipped her more than the other men she'd met on webcam. He sponsored her to the States and set her up in an apartment in the Bronx. She was only 16 when the man got her pregnant with Mickey. His earliest memories of his mom were of her smiling and laughing all the time. She told Mickey in a thick Irish accent that this was the land of opportunity, a Christian nation devoted to Jesus just as much as she was, and that one day, Mickey was going to be rich too, like his father, and help the poor as Jesus had. She told this to Mickey often, as if to remind him of a truth that he shouldn't forget. Mickey and his mom were taken care of well in those days an apartment, an allowance, TV dinners, shopping sprees, comic books, even a massage chair. The man would visit and spend nights in his mom's room while Mickey watched movies in the living room with the volume turned up. But as years went by, the man visited less. He had a family in New Jersey that his mom knew about, but she didn't care, believing his lies that he would one day leave them for her. He visited less and less, then one day, he never came back at all. A couple of months after that, the landlord said she would be evicted unless she covered the two months of missed rent. Mickey was furious and almost slapped the landlord into giving him the man's address and phone number. But the name and the numbers the man gave them all, his mom and the landlord, were all fake, lies on top of lies. Now, walking the quiet streets of the rich neighborhood, Mickey isn't completely sure if he chose Bergen County to find nicer houses to steal from or to fulfill his dream of one day breaking into a New Jersey home only to see, by chance or destiny, the fat face of his birth father in a family portrait hanging on the wall, and then finding him asleep in his king-sized bed, or waiting in the shadows for him to return home, and then maybe he would feel better about what he did to his mom. But that's an old dream, one he had given up on a long time ago. No, he's there now for the big score big enough to share with his pals in the Buckner shelter or in Tent Town over at Devaney Park, big enough to stuff cash into the donation box at the hospital that cared for his mom. And then he finds it, the biggest house he's ever seen, a mansion he once heard they were called. Mickey studies the proud structure through the bars of a tall fence guarding its grounds. This is the house Mickey feels in his heart. And relief watches over him, believing for certain he'll walk away guilt-free this night. Guilt was the only casualty Mickey risked with every break-in. It wasn't getting shot or arrested, but feeling shitty afterwards, like the night he stole a digital camera from a townhouse whose owners left the back door unlocked. Mickey later turned the camera on to see a photo of a boy, no more than ten years old. Then by pure chance or perhaps serendipity, when he was walking to a pawn shop to sell the camera, he saw a sheet of paper taped to a light post with a photo printout of a little boy, the same boy from the camera. Under the photo was a message that read, To whomever has my camera, 
Please keep it. But please return the memory card inside. It holds the last photos I have of my son, Justin, who passed away last year. You know where I live. May God lead you. That same day, Nikki left the plastic grocery bag on the doorstep of the townhouse. The camera, the memory card, an iPad, a thin gold necklace, and $31 in cash inside it, then rang the doorbell and strolled away casually. After that day, Mickey swore to himself that he'd quit stealing after just one more break-in, just to settle a small debt he owed to a friend from the shelter. But on that break-in, he snuck into a bedroom to see a large man's back facing him. Mickey squared up to protect himself, but when the man turned around, Mickey saw he was wearing virtual reality goggles over his eyes, clunky headphones covering his ears, and punching the air with sweaty fists gripping game controllers. Mickey stole everything in the man's room except for the computer he was toggled to, and chuckled to himself while making his getaway, imagining the shocked look on the man's face when he takes off the goggles to see his bedroom empty, wondering if he's in the right reality. And then he forgot all about the promise he made to himself earlier that day. Now, walking along the barred fence around the mansion, looking for the easiest way in, he sees an old elm with one long branch hanging close enough to the top of the fence to jump over it. It doesn't take much time for him to climb the tree and tight walk down the long branch, leaping over the fence and tumbling over wet grass. Rising up, he surveys the sprawling estate with its sculpted bushes and trimmed flower beds, lit by spotlights half buried in the ground. He makes his way through a small orchard patch filled with fruit trees, lush red apples and green pears hanging over him. The closer he gets to the mansion, the more he's struck by the size of it. He pauses, scanning the mansion for a window with a light, listening for any sound inside, but nothing. Even the long driveway running in a circle in front of the mansion is empty of cars or visible tire tracks. Mickey draws in a deep breath and climbs the wide stone steps leading up to the mansion's double doors of polished wood and brass fixtures that gleam from the lawn lights. He turns the knob and pushes, testing for an alarm, and is dumbfounded when the heavy doors swing open. He peeks his head inside, listening, before carefully stepping in and closing the doors behind him ever so gently. He digs out a small flashlight from the pouch of his hoodie. The small thing barely lights the grand foyer he finds himself standing in. A sweeping staircase winds up to the second floor. The marble floor at his feet gleams from the rays of his flashlight. Raising the light, Mickey sees walls adorned with traditional Japanese tapestries and paintings. To his left, he sees a conversation pit filled with large pillows and beanbags surrounded by hanging shelves filled with rows upon rows of books. To his right is a dining room with a long table by a fireplace. Mickey runs his light across the walls, looking for an alarm system box or something, anything, that would ease his nagging suspicion that this is all happening too easily. He pushes forward, the rubber bottoms of his shoes only making soft noises on the hard marble. When a sound startles him, he spins around to see a black cat wearing a red collar sitting by his heels, peeking up at him. Fucking thing, he whispers sharply through his teeth, and for an instant he's oddly jealous of the cat's stealth and silent steps. Suddenly, his small flashlight dims, then brightens as he rattles the batteries inside it, then dims again, and he curses the darkness with a scoff. Mickey treads towards the stairs, but the cat scurries ahead of him, blocking his way, meowing louder. Mickey shushes the cat, who cries even louder as Mickey glances up at the staircase, listening for people. Fucking snitch. Mickey turns and decides to scope out more of the main floor. In the dining room, he sees a painting of an old Japanese couple in kimonos hanging above the fireplace. The man in the painting is skin bald sporting a thin gray mustache, a solemn look in his green eyes. Odd for a Japanese man, Mickey thinks to himself. In the painting, the man stands stoically beside a much shorter woman, chubby, her smile so big that her eyes are squinting into the shapes of rainbows. 
Mickey scans the room for a wet bar, a liquor cabinet, even a bar cart. Nothing. Fucking weirdos, he whispers to himself. In the kitchen now, he looks for a wine rack, but still nothing. His buzz is starting to dissipate, and he can feel the cold sweats creeping up. Even his stomach seems to sober, growling at Mickey for some food. Creeping towards the huge metal fridge, he dreams of sliced roast beef, corn, mashed potatoes, mac and cheese. Pulling the handle of the fridge door, Mickey's mouth begins to water so much he's forced to swallow. In the fridge sits a cake box on the middle shelf, an open can of cat food covered with a rubber seal in the shape of a paw, and a whole frozen turkey still vacuum sealed in white plastic. And then Mickey's mind shoots back into a memory when he was 12, digging through the dumpsters behind grocery stores for expired food, finding a frozen turkey, vacuum sealed in white plastic, and only half thawed out. That night, Mickey and his mom stuffed themselves with roast turkey, using only their hands, tearing off pieces of meat directly from the roast pan, laughing at each other with greasy hands and faces. In those days, his mom could only take jobs under the table or risk being deported. Jobs like cleaning toilets and floors at an Irish bar. Or her factory job that paid her in small bills. Or the job that sent her riding an old retired school bus, rusted and painted over gray, driving her and other immigrants out into an open field at five in the morning to dig out worms from the mud, collecting them for their boss to sell as fish bait. But all that work wasn't enough to cover their rent. So Mickey started breaking into homes at 13 to steal anything he could sell to help his mom keep the apartment. When selling his stolen watches and jewelry to pawn shops, he never gave his real name. If ever they asked, which they rarely did, but when they did, he'd just say John or Jim, and that the watches and jewelry were gifts from his mom. Lies came easy to him. Even the world around him was a lie in his eyes, the land of opportunities a Christian nation that didn't give a shit about the poor. For Mickey, it really didn't matter where he lived, really. But he did it all for his mom. When Mickey was 14, his mom began repeating the same questions only minutes apart. Soon, the minutes between the repetitive questions became seconds, and Mickey knew something was wrong. They didn't have enough money to see a doctor, but a neighbor had told Mickey that his mom most likely had something she said was early onset Alzheimer's disease. The neighbor also said it rarely happened to women as young as his mom, but it does sometimes, and it did. His mom started to ask for Mickey's father, and Mickey would tell the truth that he left them years ago, and then she'd remember, and Mickey would see her heart break all over again. Eventually, Mickey would just lie, telling her that the man is out doing groceries and would be back soon, and then she'd smile, believing it for a moment until she would ask Mickey again, and then again Mickey would lie, and then again she'd believe it. She always believed Mickey, her little boy who could do no wrong. But her Alzheimer's got worse, as if her body was also forgetting how to work. When he carried her into the hospital one night, the nurses took her in and some charity covered her care. Mickey lived with her in the hospital for months, but only during visiting hours. He'd sleep by her side in the day, share her hospital food, and at night, he'd sleep in abandoned houses and in the nooks of store entrances. From the first day his mom was admitted to the hospital, Mickey never returned to their apartment again. Within months, his mom began forgetting how to swallow. She lost weight, and her immune system shut down. She died of a common flu, but the doctors called it pneumonia. Social workers from the hospital tried to force him into a foster home, but he preferred the streets he had gotten used to. He would break into homes for food and money and anything he could sell. Then one day, he stole a bottle of Irish whiskey from an East Bronx apartment and guzzled it all down while sitting under a schoolyard slide, and for the first time, he stopped thinking about his mom and all his memories emptied from his brain, and for a short time, he felt happy. Mickey shakes the memories from his head now, 
and turns his attention to the cake box. Opening it, his mouth waters again at the sight of a chocolate cake, smothered with chocolate icing and the words, Happy birthday, my love, written in red icing. And suddenly, another memory flashes into his mind, the glow in his mom's eyes blowing out the candles of her last birthday cake, there in the hospital, so happy, oblivious to her sickness. Ah, fuck it, he says to himself, fighting the urge to scoop a handful of cake, and instead runs a finger across the icing just for a little taste and places the box back onto the shelf in the fridge, his stomach protesting with a loud growl. A meow startles Mickey again, the cat sitting next to his shoe, looking up at him. The fuck you looking at? He whispers. Its head tilts up at Mickey, forcing him into a stare down. Okay, fine, fuck. Mickey peels open the seal of the can of cat food and lays it on the floor. The cat sniffs the food for a moment before burying its face in it, nibbling. Mickey closes the fridge door and notices that the power cord of the fridge is plugged into a wall outlet a few feet away. He pauses, staring at the fridge, then pulls it away from the wall. Peeking behind the fridge, he sees a wooden door held closed by a chunky metal latch, its surface rough and textured, with cracks and grooves that seem to have deepened over centuries, and then his curiosity takes over and his desire for finding valuables or riches flies from his mind, replaced by something else, something he can't explain. Mickey pulls the fridge out further and squeezes behind it, facing the door now. He grabs onto its latch and slides the heavy bolt into place with a satisfying thud. Mickey pushes the heavy thing and it creaks on its rusted hinges, revealing the mouth of a spiral stone staircase descending down into the earth. Without a second thought, he takes the first step and then the other until he's winding down the staircase round and round in a tight coil, deeper and deeper until the minutes begin to feel like hours and then his sense of time begins to blur. He's unsure if hours have passed or days, but he doesn't care and pushes on as if by a will that was not his own. He stops when he sees an orange glow on the steps below. Now he has to use his own will and a little bit of courage to take the next steps down, slowly, one foot after the other, until his toes leave the final step of the staircase. He finds himself standing at the edge of a circular room, its stone walls wet and cold, the air musty and dense. The room is dimly lit by a large lantern burning an orange flame hanging from a chain bolted to the low ceiling, its faint light stretching out in all directions, revealing five wooden doors evenly spaced around the circular wall. Each door is carved with a cryptic symbol. The first door is marked with a shield, pointed at its bottom and wide at its top. Rows of horizontal lines slant down and inwards from its sides and meet at the center of the shield. The second door is marked with a katana, its blade pointing upwards and piercing through what looks to be a storm cloud. The third door is marked with a pair of cat eyes, slanting inwards, its pupils two thin vertical slits. The fourth door is marked with a pair of six-sided dice, each rolled out of one, snake eyes. And the fifth door is marked with the outline of a devil head with many horns its two longest horns on each opposite side. Mickey presses his ear to the wood of the first door, listening for any sound within, but there's only empty silence. He pushes the door open easily and sees a vast chamber beyond it. It's dimly lit by candlelight lanterns mounted on its tall walls that stretch up to a high stone ceiling. Steel pipes bolted to the floor stand seven feet tall throughout the chamber all of them bent in different spots. A bank safe the size of a van sits in the center of the chamber, large dents on its sides, as if cannonballs were fired at it. The door of the safe has been ripped open. It's now hanging from one broken hinge, revealing nothing inside. Mickey makes his way into the second chamber, identical to the first, but empty, 
save for a wooden dummy standing upright near the back wall, wearing a blue akama and a metallic jingaza. Hundreds of footprints mark the stone floor pointing in every direction. Mickey pushes open the third chamber's door, only to see a darkness stretching out into a black void. In the fourth chamber stands a number of stickmen that Mickey recognizes from the karate dojo down the street from his mom's old apartment. But in that dojo, the stickmen were mounted on the floor, and here they're mounted on the walls and high ceiling. Almost all their limbs broken or snapped completely off, wooden shards scattered all around. Dozens of crossbows hang on the walls of the fifth chamber. Crossbow bolts litter the ground, some embedded into the stone floor, and others laying on their side, broken in half. Suddenly, Mickey hears heavy footsteps descending the staircase, echoing louder and louder with each step. Mickey darts into the third chamber and closes the wooden door, leaving it slightly ajar to peek through it. He waits, swallowing then swallowing again, and then he sees him, a figure of a man wearing a loud three-piece suit, showing off intricate designs of purple, gray, and black. But his head, Mickey draws in a sharp breath. His head looks as if it were made of solid turquoise, faceless, and polished like a statue. Mickey's heart beats faster, disbelieving his own eyes, but the figure couldn't see him. That would be impossible, Mickey thinks, shrouded in the darkness of the chamber, peeking only through a sliver of an opening. The figure turns his head slowly, as if scanning the room without eyes, then pauses before turning back towards the staircase, making him feel his breathing begin to slow. But then the figure stops again and jerks his head directly at Mickey. Mickey jolts to the side and presses his back against the chamber wall. He listens for footsteps but only hears a long silence broken by a single droplet of water falling from the chamber's damp ceiling onto the stone floor, its sound echoing softly off the walls. More silence passes. Mickey musters up the courage to peek through the opening again and a wave of relief washes over him, seeing the circular room empty, the figure gone. Mickey presses his back against the wall again gathering himself, staring into the pitch blackness ahead of him. He takes in a long, deep breath and exhales slowly. He wishes he had a bottle of whiskey to chug right now, but tequila, vodka, or anything would do, really. And then he hears the gentle boom of so many candle flames igniting in the lanterns lining the walls of the chamber, lighting the darkness, revealing the figure standing at the center of the chamber. Adrenaline surges through Mickey's veins, and he charges at the figure with clenched fists, compelled by the survival instinct instilled in him from years of living on the streets. The figure stands firmly as Mickey rushes at him, and when finally in striking distance, Mickey throws a straight right punch at the figure, still standing calmly, like a statue. Only when Mickey's fist reaches two inches away from the figure's featureless face, the figure raises his leather-gloved hand, lightning quick, and catches Mickey's fist. He bends it back with impossible strength, forcing Mickey to his knees to save his wrist from snapping. The pain is unbearable, but Mickey doesn't scream or grimace. He never did in all of his fights, even the ones he lost, which were many. Mickey's body quivers, beads of sweat forming over his upper lip, the only indications of his pain. What's your name, child? The figure's voice echoes from everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Mickey, he yells, trying to say John, but the truth is forced from his mouth. If I let you go, will you calm yourself? No, he yells, trying to say yes, but the truth is forced from his mouth. For a moment, Mickey is dumbstricken by his inability to speak a lie but then the excruciating pain in his wrist distracts him from thinking anything else. Is it your wish to have this kind of power, child? Yes, he grunts through clenched teeth, speaking the truth with intention, finally. There is a price you have to pay for this kind of power. Are you willing to pay it? Yes, he says. 
The figure places his other gloved hand on the top of Mickey's head, and then he faints into a faint, within a faint, within a faint. <laughs> Chapter 3. Ambition Without Virtue Marshall Whisper. Good. Wu-Tang Marshall Whisper. Tires screech, echoing off the cement walls and ceilings in the cavernous underground parking lot scattered with police cars, uniformed NYPD police officers, and plain-clothed detectives standing inside a section of the parking lot blocked off with yellow crime scene tape. They all turned their heads to see Luchin on his MTT 420 RR motorcycle, matte black, drift in a wide circle, leaving a long sweeping skid mark ending inches away from the yellow crime scene tape. Luchin steps off the bike wearing no helmet, just a black dress shirt and a black tie under an Italian tailored black suit. Crisply pressed all the way down to his black designer dress shoes, he hangs his black backpack on the handle of his bike and presses his hands over his perfectly slick black hair parted to the side. Luchin is American-born Cantonese, handsome, despite the scar running down the left side of his face, from his forehead down through his eyebrow and ending at his jawline. A tattoo of a giant black centipede runs up under his collar, winding up the side of his neck and ending over his right cheek in a pincered head. Unbuttoning his suit jacket, the wooden handle of his silver-plated 357 Magnum dips heavy on his side holster. An intricate design of a laughing Buddha is carved into the handle's wood and painted white, red, and yellow. Luchin lifts the yellow tape and strolls under it when a fat NYPD detective in a brown suit marches at him, flashing his badge. You're out of your jurisdiction, Queens, he orders. Luchin snatches the badge from his meaty hand and slides it into the inside pocket of his suit jacket. You know who I am, and now I know who you are, Luchin says with an unwavering stare. A couple of officers approach to stand behind the fat detective. Let him through, the detective says after a long pause. Luchin winks and pats the detective's chubby cheek, who lowers his head as Luchin brushes past him. Ahead, he sees a massive dead body slumped over on the hood of a pink Bugatti. The forensic team snapping photos of the scene scurry away as Luchin approaches. Luchin steps into the pool of blood surrounding the car and faces the body slouching on its hood, its head lowered, its face hidden by the bill of its pink baseball cap. The intestines hanging out of his open belly are dry now, hardened and white. The body's white jeans are completely soaked in red, with no patches of white left anywhere on it. Leaning over, Luchin opens the torn flaps of the body's ripped t-shirt and reads the tattooed words under each of its collarbones. Iron. Fame. Homeboy had it coming, says a uniformed officer behind Luchin, sipping coffee from a thermos. Who you think did this, Nine Trey? Luchin ignores the officer and adjusts his tie before turning away, knowing everything he needs to know. Buttoning his suit jacket, Luchin strolls back to his bike, indifferent to the chatter and stares from the cops around him, tracking bloody footprints on the pavement everywhere he steps. Chapter 4 The Third Chamber Groggy, Mickey wakes on his back on the cold stone floor of the chamber, dazed, unsure how long he's been out. He turns his head to the side, looking around for the figure, but finds himself alone. All looks the same, the candle lanterns burning on the stone walls, the high ceilings wet with moisture. Somehow, the trunk of a bamboo tree, green and sturdy, 
has sprouted from the stone floor and seemed to have grown through the ceiling, one long trunk, no branches or leaves. Mickey staggers to stand up, his body trembling and sweating. He spits a silent curse at the alcohol withdrawal he knows is creeping up to consume him even stronger at any moment. He'll soon need booze, any booze, or else suffer from the fever, the convulsions, the intense craving, the persistent aching that seems to never end, a form of cruel torture Mickey had always thought. Oi! Mickey bangs on the locked wooden door. Mickey kicks it, then kicks it again with all his might, but the wood is too thick and strong. Mickey recalls crossing with the figure and wonders how long ago it was. Had he been asleep for minutes, hours, days? Rubbing his wrist, he remembers the intense pain that is all but gone now, not even a small trace of it left. And then he recalls his strange inability to lie. My name is Mickey. Again, he attempts to say his name is John, but still can't. My name is... He pauses, then musters sheer willpower to scream out John, but then, Mickey! His knuckles pinch into the stone wall. Fucking piece of... Fuck! How? I've recorded you. A smooth, deep voice echoes from everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Mickey turns to see the figure standing in the center of the chamber, holding a red silk sheet folded into a square, bands of cloth wrapped into tight cylinders, and a wooden bucket of water with a dry rag hanging from its rim. The water is for washing, child. You need not drink it. There is a reservoir drain in the corner. You may bathe over it. How long you plan to keep me here? Until you are ready. Are you going to bring me down some food or what? In here, you will feel no hunger. Mickey squints, realizing he had not eaten for more than a day, but the constant grumbling in his belly has subsided. Where the fuck am I going to take a shit? In these five chambers, you will not age, you will not eat, you will not urinate or defecate, but you will sleep for that is all your mind needs. These are the five chambers outside of time. In here, you are only your mind, nothing more. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, to be honest. Mickey shakes his head. And what do I call you? You can call me Master. All right, then. You got any booze, Master? I do. What kind? Every kind. Fucking A, right. Leave me with the bottle and I'll stay here as long as you want, broski. No. Then fuck it. Let me out of here. Here, you will learn discipline, my pupil. For your mind and for your body. For both are the same here. There you go again with that shit, Mickey says. The master lays the garments in the bucket on the ground and turns towards the door. Why are you doing this, Mickey says. The master turns back around to face him. You are asking the wrong question. All right, then. What's the right one? The correct question is, why are you doing this? Psh! I already know that. I want to take names and kick ass like you. Closer, the master says. Why don't you just fucking tell me then, broski, since you know everything, Mickey says. You're doing this because you're a rebel in your reality. You see, my child, humans are hard-coded to adapt themselves to the reality they're subjected to. But for some, the rebels, they insist in adapting reality to themselves. Thus, the disruption of reality can only come from a rebel, like you, my pupil. The master pauses. And so now you have the answer to your first question, for this is the reason why I am doing this. The master presses his palms together in front of his forehead, and Mickey wonders why. Now rest, my child. Meditate. When we are done, then you will know yourself, your true self, not the mask you wear now, the mask of flesh. You will earn your true face, my pupil. Mickey sits at the kitchen table of his mom's old apartment 
eating from a bowl of Fruit Loops gone soggy from milk, his favorite. He looks into the living room and sees his mom sitting on the sofa, facing the TV, her long scarlet hair falling onto the sofa's backrest. An episode of Sesame Street is playing on the TV, Ernie singing a song about wishing to visit the moon. Mom! Mickey's heart fills up, feeling like it's about to explode, how he misses her so much. He dashes into the living room, but when he turns the corner of the sofa to face her, Mickey's heart sinks into his gut. His mom sits faceless, featureless, only her freckled skin. Mickey shakes her shoulders, but she doesn't move. John? He hears his own voice call out behind him. He spins around and the TV is no longer there, only the large mirror atop his mom's dresser, and Mickey finds himself in her bedroom now. He staggers towards the large mirror and sees himself aged, an old man. Mickey stares at the deep lines that have formed around his different colored eyes and tries to remember his name, but can't. John, he whispers. Jim? And then he feels the cold stone floor at his side. A drop of water breaks onto his temple, and he wakens from the nightmare, curled up onto his side in a fetal position, in a corner of the stone chamber. He's drenched in sweat, trembling uncontrollably, his head throbbing, body aches gnawing at him relentlessly from his feet up to his neck. Your future and past haunt you, my child. The figure appears in the chamber, or perhaps he's always been there. But the future nor the past cannot harm you, because they do not exist. What harms you is your imagination and your memory. How long have I fucking been here? Mickey shivers. You've been here for no time at all. I still don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Know this, child. The pain you feel exists only in your mind. My fucking body's burning up. I'm shaking like shit. This ain't just in my mind, broski. Mickey snaps. It is true. Your symptoms are physical. But the pain is not. It is neither pain nor pleasure. It is simply a sensation that you can decipher in your mind however you wish. Now stand. I can't. But you can speak. You can think. You can react with suffering or not. It's your choice how to decipher what it is that you feel. Now stand. I can't. Very well. But know this. You are not suffering from these physical sensations. You are suffering from your resistance and your desire. Mickey tightens his own embrace around his knees, pressed against his chest, and closes his eyes, wishing for oblivion. Come, dear, says an old Japanese woman, shaking Mickey's shoulder. Mickey awakens, still curled onto his side, his trembling somewhat calmer. He opens his eyes reluctantly and sees the woman he had seen in the painting, smiling, slightly hunched, wearing the same kimono kneeling beside him, holding up a steaming bowl of miso soup in both her chubby hands. Here, my dear, this will help. Mickey struggles to sit up. The woman lays the bowl on the ground and pulls Mickey up by his armpits. I don't agree with my husband's methods, she says, shaking her head. Who are you? Mickey sits up and crosses his legs, wrapping himself in his own arms to fight the chills. Call me Mrs. Nakamoto, my dear. She says in an accent that Mickey couldn't quite place. Not Japanese nor American. The old woman raises the bowl of soup up to Mickey, who takes it from her. She smiles wider, and Mickey imagines how much prettier she must have been in her youth. In here, your body doesn't require nourishment, but you can still take the pleasure from it. Nothing wrong with that, right? Mickey brings the bowl to his lips and sips, then looks at Mrs. Nakamoto with wide eyes. What the fuck? Do you like? Mickey tilts the bowl and slurps louder, nodding his head. Well, anything tastes good when you haven't eaten for a long time. Not this fucking good, 
Mickey says after swallowing. If my husband asks about this, can you promise not to tell him? I don't think I could promise that, to be honest, Mickey says before another long slurp. Oh, yes, yes, that's right, Mrs. Nakamoto chuckles, indulging in the sight of Mickey's enjoyment. In that case, no promises. Chapter 5 The Chinese Triad Motorcycle Club Lu Chin Chan stares up at the water-stained ceiling of some basement in Chinatown, Queens. Lying naked on his back on a stone altar, its edges decorated with small bowls burning incense as three tattoo artists work on him, one on his leg, one on his side, one on his chest and neck. The old incense master chants in Cantonese, walking circles around the altar, holding a white chicken clucking in his arms. The pain from the three needles stabbing into his skin on different areas of his body was bearable for the first two hours, but six hours have passed since, without any breaks and Luchin starting to sweat. Luchin doesn't care much for the initiation ritual he's enduring, but it is necessary for earning a red pole rank at the Chinese Triad Motorcycle Club, a syndicate of young American-born Chinese gangsters who adopted the intimidation tactics of the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club, riding the streets of Queens in large packs, polluting the neighborhoods with the noise of roaring motors. But the CTMC doesn't ride Harley Davidsons they prefer the speed of sports bikes, like the Kawasaki Ninja H2R or the Suzuki GSX 1300 R Hayabusa. The CTMC started out as a common street gang protecting Chinatown, Queens, and its surrounding blocks from the Puerto Ricans infringing in their business. Mostly prostitution, underground gambling, drugs, extortion, kidnapping smuggling, and murder for hire. Eventually, the 14K Triad and its 20,000 members worldwide took notice of the CTMC and made them an official chapter, resulting in these kinds of ridiculous rituals, Luchin thinks to himself, lying there, sweating in pain. The 14K even sent one mountain master from Hong Kong to oversee their whole operation from his comfy mansion far away in Connecticut. Luchin never saw him or knew his name. He took all his orders from Jin, his Dilo. He wonders when Jin will finally show up so they can get this initiation over with. The ritual required all recruits to choose animals representing the fighting styles of Shaolin Kung Fu. Dragons, snakes, cranes, leopards, and tigers to tattoo onto their bodies, starting from their left foot, then winding up their leg, around their back, chest, and neck, and ending at their face. But Luchin chose a centipede, a fighting style deemed too deadly by the ancient Shaolin monks, and was outlawed, forbidden to practice, though some, the rebels of those times, practiced in secret, until all were discovered and executed by the Shaolin, their scrolls set on fire, and then the centipede style disappeared from history, only to be whispered about as legend. Jin allowed Lu Chin's choice, and even commended it. Lu Chin can hear Jin's footsteps thud down the stairs before busting through the door. Ha! Jin shoots a wild smile at Lu Chin, taking pleasure in his suffering. He's short, even by Cantonese standards his black suit crumpling at his wrists and ankles. The tattooed head of a crane peeks out from under his collar and covers the side of his neck, its long beak rising up across his cheek. Jin asks the incense master in Cantonese how much longer they will be, who answers, not too long. This is going to be fun, brother. Jin presses his left hand on Luchin's sweaty shoulder, his pinky finger missing. One of the tattoo artists stops, wiping the blood from Luchin's thigh and announces he's done. 
Then the other two artists happen to finish at the same time. Luchin sits up from the altar and eyes the centipede tattoo winding up his body. Get dressed, Jin orders, and Luchin walks to his black suit hanging in the corner and hastily dresses, its fabric stinging his freshly pierced skin. The incense master places the chicken, a knife, a drinking glass half filled with red wine, a round tin plate, a rag, a lit candle, a rolled up scroll, a tiny wooden box, and a chopping board on the altar. Let's get this over with, Lucian says, tucking his shirt into his pants. Oh, you young punks don't know anything about honor. Jin swipes his hand up. The tattoo artists gather their gear and run up the stairs in haste. Lucian faces the altar, knowing what needs to be done. He grabs the chicken with one hand and the knife in the other. He eyes the knife and is pleased to see its pristine sharpness. He runs the blade across the chicken's throat as it flaps wildly, then squeezes its neck over the wine glass, blood pouring into it in a thin stream. He leaves the dying chicken on the altar, lying on its side, flapping weakly every now and then. Then Luchin brings the cup up to his lips and drinks down the wine and blood mixture to the last drop. Jin is quiet beside him, his eyes closed, listening to the incense master, mouthing some kind of prayer. Luchin unravels the long, thin scroll, staining it with some chicken blood, and reads the sprawling Cantonese script running down the paper, the triad's thirty-four oaths, then hovers one corner of the paper over the candle flame until it catches fire. Luchin drops the burning scroll onto the tin plate, where it rolls back into a loose coil, its flames spreading through it. And without any hesitation, he presses his left hand on the chopping board, grips the knife tightly in his other hand, and slices across the base of his pinky finger, severing it off completely. Blood spurts out across the altar before Luchin presses the rag hard on his open wound. The incense master snatches the severed pinky from the chopping board and lays it into the tiny wooden box. He closes its lid and announces in Cantonese that the ritual is complete, handing Jin the small box. The pinky ritual isn't a traditional triad custom, but adopted from the Japanese Yakuza, believing in the power of its gesture. Jin opens his eyes and sees Luchin pressing the rag into his left hand. You're fucking idiot, Jin says. You did the wrong hand. Now do the other one, now. Luchin forces a smile as Jin starts chuckling. Where does that thing go? Luchin points at the box with his eyes. To the mountain master. What's he gonna do with it? Fuck if I know. Maybe eat it or some shit. Jin snickers and pats Luchin on the shoulder, still pressing the rag on his hand. The boys are waiting at Rolsan. Let's drink. Luchin turns to the staircase, but Jin stops him. Brother. Jin raises his left hand, missing its pinky, tucks his thumb over his palm, lifting three fingers into the air. Welcome to the club. Luchin removes the rag from his hand and does the same, a single trail of blood running down his forearm, a gesture binding him to the triad. Chapter 6 The Crossbody Block The master, surprisingly agile in his three piece suit, presses into Mickey with a series of Muay Thai body kicks, his legs swinging at Mickey's sides like baseball bats. Mickey blocks each kick, bringing his knee up to his elbow, creating a wall of shin and forearm, protecting his body, bones clashing onto bones. Mickey backsteps to gain balance, but the master's assaults advance with his every backstep, forcing Mickey to defend. The master drops low, and Mickey knows he's been set up. He tenses his muscles as the master shifts his weight to his back leg, then springs it forward with a knee strike aimed at Mickey's core. Mickey thought to bring his knee up to his opposite elbow for a crossbody block that the master had taught him, 
but on impulse, Mickey parries the master's knee with an inside forearm block, then takes a painful left hook to his chin, knocking him onto his back. Mickey pounds the ground with his fist in frustration. The master strains his stance, adjusting the wrinkles in his three-piece suit. A cross-body block was the correct move, the master says. The block is shit. Mickey spits, jumping back up onto his heels wrapped tight in bands of cloth. His fingers peek through similar cloth wraps winding around his knuckles and wrists. Sweat drenches the red silk sheet tied around his waist and under his loins, secured by a hard knot on his pelvis. The block leaves me with no fucking counter, Mickey protests. But you blunted my attack. Aye, just to take more, like a fucking bitch, Mickey argues. You said every move should have a counter. There is no fucking counter using that fucking block. In that variant, returning to even footing offers you the highest positive expected value. The block is shit, Mickey spits. Return to your stance. The master squares up. Before Mickey realizes, the master presses into him, unloading straight front kicks, straight cross punches, downward sweeping elbow strikes forcing Mickey backwards and in circles around the chamber. Mickey notices a pattern as the master's attacks target his core, forcing Mickey's arms to tuck at his sides to protect him from abdomen and liver shots. Then the master crouches low and yells, Crossbody block! As his knee drives upwards into Mickey, but Mickey is ready for it. He parries the knee with an inside forearm block with all his strength forcing the master to spin, revealing his back, vulnerable. This is Mickey's chance, he thinks, firing a straight right cross at the back of the master's head. But the master, letting his momentum spin him full circle, unloads a vicious back fist at the side of Mickey's head before his blow can land, dropping him unconscious. Mickey wakes up a few minutes later, flat on his back. What have you learned, my child? Asked the master, standing over him. The block is shit. Mickey turns his head and spits out blood onto the chamber floor. The master reaches out his hand and pulls Mickey to his feet. Your effort was sound, my pupil. You fucking expected it, Mickey scoffs, wiping the blood from his lips with the back of his wrapped hands. The master nods. But do not fret, my pupil. I've seen the counter attempted before. Did you fuck up the broski's head like you did mine? No. I watched the counter fail from the same perspective as you have watched it fail. Mickey's head perks up. I've collected data over thousands of years. You are but a child, my pupil. You will learn. The cross-body block is the correct move, according to the math. Mickey nods acknowledging that he hears what the master is saying, but not understanding what he means at the slightest. And then the master lays his hand on Mickey's shoulder, and he's taken aback by it. It's the first time the master expressed any form of affection. One day, you may find a better counter and prove the math wrong. That is my wish for you, my pupil. The master steps back, placing his palms together in front of his forehead, and Mickey does the same. The master turns and moves towards the chamber door, leaving Mickey standing there, feeling that the master had left him with something very important to ponder, but he has no idea where to even start. Mickey kneels in the center of the chamber floor, sitting back on his heels, his palms pressed together in front of his face. Deep bruises cover both his forearms and elbows, the skin of his shins bright red the green bark of the bamboo trunk sprouting up through the chamber is all but splintered and peeling off, revealing whitish wood behind it, stained with dry blood. Mickey no longer has any perception of the time he had spent in the chamber. He meditates on his breathing, on being present in this moment. The past doesn't exist. The future doesn't exist. There is only the now and only the chamber. He hears a heavy thud on the floor in front of him. When he opens his eyes, 
He sees a 1.75 liter bottle of Jameson triple distilled Irish whiskey, its maroon cap still sealed onto the thick neck of the huge green glass bottle standing upright on the floor in front of him. You've earned this, my pupil, the master says, standing at a distance. Rising with the bottle in his hand, he twists open the cap and pours the whiskey into the reservoir grate at the back corner of the chamber. He sits the bottle on top of the grate, its label facing away. He then approaches the master, facing him, dropping into a narrow Muay Thai stance and raises his wrapped fists. Attack me core, master, Mickey says. The master presses his palms together in front of his forehead, then drags one foot back and curls his hands into fists under his faceless turquoise head. Let us begin, the master says. Chapter 7 Operation Blood Rain Luchin enters the truck stop diner off Interstate 587 in upstate New York, slouching, his Baltimore Orioles cap tipped low over his eyes. The tall collars of his Prada raincoat pulled up high, covering the centipede tattoo on his neck and cheek. He shoots sideways glances around the diner. There's one trucker eating breakfast alone at the bar, and Captain Winfield is sitting in a corner booth. Both his hands are wrapped around a steaming coffee mug. Bringing it up to his tightly pressed lips, he scowls at Luchin as he approaches. Captain, Luchin sits down opposite him. You're late, scolds Winfield. Sorry. What are you eating? says Winfield, his wind-worn skin looking as tough as his leather jacket. I was going to ask you the same thing. I ordered us eggs. I don't eat eggs. You don't eat eggs? I prefer pancakes. A server approaches the booth, refilling Winfield's mug. Listen, honey, can you please change one order of eggs to pancakes for little Miss fucking pancake over here? Thank you. The server nods and saunters away. What's with that? Who are you, Cal Ripken Jr.? chides Winfield. Who? Take it off. Luchin lays his cap on the table. Now listen. Winfield lifts his mug to his lips, a $55,000 Patek Philippe watch dangling on his wrist. There's been chatter on the mountain man's wire. He's worried about informants in the club. Informants? Nah, impossible. We're loyal to the death, says Luchin. Oh, it's we now. Winfield bellows. Well, we planted some fake intel when we got a warrant on the old man's mansion up in Connecticut. Turned the place inside out. I want you to tell your dialo to set up a meeting in Queens with the old man. He'll come, trust me. What kind of meeting? Luchin questions. The takeover kind. Winfield sips his coffee, holding a stare at Luchin from over the rim of his mug. Winfield slides a folded piece of paper across the table. What's this? It's my new number. Text me on this one, not the other one. Winfield leans forward, his inflated gut pressing against the edge of the table. Give me the address, the date, the time. Then on the day, when he's on the way there, text me, Hey baby. When he's at the meeting, text me, Wanna fuck? And then just hold tight for me and the boys. Winfield was always so eager to work in the field, Luchin often noticed, unlike most captains shouting orders from behind a desk. That was one thing he respected about him. Listen, I'm going to make you lieutenant when this is done. You earned it. And one day you're going to be captain. You know that, Wu? Luchin looks around nervously. What's wrong, Wu? Forgot who you are for a second? Winfield laughs chugging the last of his coffee before standing up and throwing two twenties on the table. Now don't fuck up. He zips up his leather jacket and waddles away. Your eggs are coming, Luchin yells over his shoulder. 
You have them. I hate eggs. Things always came fast for Elliot Wu. He learned at a grade 10 level when he was in grade 2. And he was sent away from his public school in Queens to start grade 3 at a school for gifted students somewhere upstate. Year after year, at the top of his class, he graduated early at 11 years old and finished high school in two years, getting full scholarship offers from Ivy League universities at 13. Elliot chose MIT and earned his Bachelor of Science in Aerospace Engineering degree at 17. After his graduation ceremony, the opportunities were endless for Elliot. He could have worked for the U.S. Air Force, designing faster military aircrafts, or developed systems for space travel for NASA. But instead, Elliot chose to enter the 24-week program at the NYPD Police Academy. That's where Queen's Finest discovered Elliot. Queen's Finest was a syndicate of corrupt cops stretching across every precinct in Queen's and Elliot knew everything there was to know about them. Queen's finest were so feared that cops from the other four boroughs stayed out of their way. Even the tech startup company headquartered in Queen's had to pay weekly tribute to them until they received a third round of venture capitalist funding and moved their offices across the country to California and then stopped paying tribute altogether. But sometime after the company went IPO, making the CEO founder a billionaire. The CEO came home one night to his Silicon Valley mansion to see the floor littered with his dead pets, four purebred dogs, three African gray parrots, and one cat. After that, the CEO continued to pay triple the tribute, halfway across the country, plus interest. Queen's Finest wore the same NYPD uniforms, wore the same badges, but they weren't the same NYPD. They all wore Patek Philippe watches on their left wrists, the only sign that they weren't really NYPD. They were simply the law in a lawless borough. Queen's Finest ran everything in Queen's, except for Chinatown, held strong by the Chinese Triad Motorcycle Club, which gave Queen's Finest the biggest hard-on. Even if they murdered a few Red Poles and Dilo, more would be organized by their mountain master who was untouchable. They knew the only way to annihilate the CTMC was from within. So when Captain Winfield, who ran the undercover unit in Queen's Finest, met Elliot in the academy, he recruited him two weeks before his graduation simply because he was Chinese, spoke Cantonese fluently, and was unknown to the CTMC. Winfield offered Elliot to lead an operation to infiltrate the highest ranks of the CTMC, which would likely take years, but would secure him with a lieutenant position in Queen's Finest. Elliot agreed without a second thought, and Operation Blood Rain was born. For the operation, Elliot legally changed his name to Lu Chin Chan, a name he was proud of, a name he chose himself. Winfield chose his new birth date, though making Luchin one year older so he could throw him into Rikers Island as an adult charged with assaulting a police officer. That's where Luchin laid on a thick Cantonese accent and made like a young Chinese immigrant, struggling with his English, despite grading perfectly in every English essay and exam he's ever taken. But it was easy for him to act the part. He learned the art of deception quickly, like everything else he'd ever learned in his life. Queen's Finest knew the CTMC inmates would protect him in there, just for being Cantonese. The street beef between the Puerto Ricans and the CTMC extended well into Rikers Island. One day, when a full-on brawl erupted in the common room between the two sects, Luchin found himself facing up against a large Puerto Rican, winding back for a devastating punch. Before he could throw it, Luchin struck his throat with the webbed blade of his open hand breaking his windpipe. He followed up with a straight cross from his other hand, landing solid on the Puerto Rican's chin, knocking him onto his back, unconscious. When the guards finally came charging in with their pepper spray and shields, breaking up the brawl, they saw the Puerto Rican dead on his back, drowned by his own blood. 
Luchin made a name for himself then and there. Two days after being released from Rikers Island, he was called in for a sit-down with a CTMC vanguard recruiting new members. Things always came fast for Lu Chin Chan. Two vanguards, five Dilo, including Jin, and four Red Poles, including Lu Chin, make a big deal about rising from their seats around the long table in the conference room of some unleashed office building floor, bowing low below their waists, when the mountain master, short and frail in his oversized suit, enters the room in his wheelchair pushed by the deputy mountain master and two Dilo bodyguards at his side. The deputy mountain master parks the triad elder at the center of the long table and all rise up from their bows, back straight and proud. The mountain master gestures for all to sit down and all comply, except for the four red poles assigned to stand guard behind their superiors, their backs facing each of the four walls of the room. Luchin's back faces the large windows opposite the room's only door. A vanguard welcomes the mountain master in Cantonese as Luchin slips his hand into his pocket, feeling for his phone, texting Winfield blindly. The mountain master doesn't say a single word as thirty minutes pass, the deputy mountain master grilling the room about whacking every new recruit and straw sandal in the club, just to be safe. Jin protests slamming his fist onto the table, vouching his life on certain recruits that were named. Their voices grow louder in debate, then stops abruptly when automatic gunfire rings out from a few floors below. All at the table rise, except for the mountain master still in his wheelchair, his back facing the room's only exit, his Dilo bodyguard shielding his back with guns drawn. Everyone in the room is aiming their handguns at the exit, no one speaking a word as automatic gunfire approaches, louder and closer. Luchin stands at the furthest from the exit, everyone's back facing him. He grips then regrips his fully loaded 15-round pistol with both his clammy hands, aiming at the exit like everyone else. He hears the blood pulsing between his ears when he notices the mountain master, the only one facing him lock his eyes onto Luchin for a long moment. Luchin sees a subtle change in his expression, and he knows, almost for certain, that the old man understands what's to come. Fourteen shots pop from Luchin's pistol in rapid concession, and fourteen bodies crumple, dropping one by one like a wave from one side of the room to the other. Jin, the vanguards, the deputy mountain master, the Dilo, and the red poles, all but one old man who only slouches deeper in his wheelchair, blood spurting out from his right eye. The sound of bodies thudding onto the floor above Winfield, along with his unwavering trust in Luchin's competence, sends him storming up the staircase, down the hallway, and crashing through the door of the conference room. Winfield sees Luchin standing among the dead bodies, his pistol drawn down still smoking in his hands. Winfield lowers his assault rifle and scans the room, a look of triumph swelling in his eyes. Chinatown is ours, he whispers to himself. Winfield doesn't even notice Luchin raising his pistol again. He fires the last bullet in his chamber that enters the center of Winfield's forehead, exits the back of his head, and embeds itself in the wall behind him. Chinatown is mine. Luchin whispers. Chapter 8 The Blinder A forensic medical examiner, skinny under his white lab coat, struggles to close the heavy door of the walk in refrigerator, storing bodies yet to be examined. He finally manages to shut the door with a loud clang and turns to face the cold, spacious lab. Saws, scalpels, forceps, and other instruments hang on one of its walls in a neat row under a shelf holding jars and bottles filled with chemicals, solutions, and preservatives. The wall faces a metal examination table, gleaming bright from a single overhead light. A series of gurneys holding cadavers, 
all covered in crisp white sheets, pulled up to reveal their tagged feet, are positioned evenly throughout the other half of the room. The examiner snatches a clipboard hanging from one of the gurneys and brings it over to his assistant sitting at a computer desk in the corner, cluttered with paperwork. He drops the clipboard onto the desk when all the lights in the room, the ceiling lights, the examination table's overhead light, even the computer monitor on the desk, all turn off at the same time, throwing the lab into pitch darkness. The sound of blowing air from the vent softens, then dies out completely. Blackout? asks the assistant. Blown fuse, maybe. The examiner blindly feels his way along the desk for his phone to call maintenance. He doesn't even hear the blinder's dead silent footsteps enter the room, despite the hard heavy soles of his black Doc Martin boots. The blinder scans the bleak space through thick eyepieces on his thermoplastic mask, snugging onto his face under the bill of his blood-red newsboy cap, and can see the entire room with crystal clearness, as if the lab was lit by sunlight. He brushes inches past the examiner still searching the desk with his hands, knocking over some papers onto the floor, oblivious to the blinder so close to him. Breathing in the sterile air and the faint smell of disinfectant, the blinder wades through the rows of gurneys and then he finds it, a massive frame under a white sheet, mocha-toned feet peeking out from under it. The examiner must have found his phone because the blinder can hear him yapping as he pulls the white sheet down off the massive cadaver, revealing its wide head and thick nose, then pulls the sheet even lower exposing broad shoulders and a hairy chest with two words tattooed under each collarbone. Iron. Fame. A gentle boom echoes through the vents, and then all the lights in the room turn on. The computer chimes as it restarts, and the examiner turns to see the door to the hallway wide open. Chapter 9 The Five Deadly Rebels The last thing the slugger remembers is falling asleep in Caesar's bed, lying there, recalling the day that had passed, stocking shelves, sweeping floors, and stacking boxes in the bodega down the street, only to be denied his daily wage by the owner at the end of his 12-hour shift. He remembers holding a box cutter at the owner's throat, forcing him to open the safe in the back room, and leaving through the bodega's back door with thousands in cash stuffed into his pockets and waistband. And then he remembers smiling, there on Caesar's bed, feeling the satisfaction he imagined the gangsters in his neighborhood must have felt when walking the streets, notorious. Now, waking from a dreamless sleep, he expects to feel his body under sheets and blankets. Instead, he feels the sting of metal cuffs on his wrists, biting into his skin as he hangs from chains, his arms spread wide above him, his back pressed against a rough stone wall, his toes barely touching the ground. He opens his eyes slowly to see a dim orange glow through a thin horizontal slit, something cold and heavy fastened onto his face. Then the room beyond comes into focus. A circular chamber with five wooden doors and a faceless figure in a loud three-piece suit, its head made of polished turquoise, slouching on a wooden throne under a large lantern hanging from the ceiling. The figure grips the cloth-wrapped handle of a katana in one of his hands, its tip of its sheathed blade grounded between his feet, hanging from his neck, Heavy over its purple and black patterned tie is a dark silver chain encrusted with pink diamonds and a single gold-plated ledger dangling from one of its links. And then, gradually, he begins to remember the months, 
or years or decades he had spent in the chamber of standing pipes, training with the figure, the master, yes, the master, and suddenly he comes to know all that he had already known. Along the circular wall, four others hang from chains beside each door of the room, all of them masked, their bodies draped in black tang suits, panku knots fastening their suit jackets closed, all the way up to their mandarin collars, standing high on their necks. Listen, my pupils, for these are the last lessons I shall bestow upon you, and then you may never see me again. The master's voice echoes from everywhere and nowhere. In the reality that exists above these chambers, you are rebels, five rebels from each of the five boroughs, the gangster, the hustler, the raider, the gambler, the corrupt. The master stands, bringing the katana up and resting it on his shoulder. But make no mistake, my children, you are all innocent, hard-coded from birth. I have seen the math and witnessed all your fates. That is, up there, in the river of time and reality, whose flow is determined. But in here, in the five chambers outside of time and reality, I have tested your code through decades of iteration. And to my surprise, you have all reached the same numeric condition, mastering ancient disciplines. Judo, Kendo, Muay Thai, Karate, Kung Fu. To a degree that my calculations once rendered mathematically impossible. Holding the katana wide across his body, the master unsheathes its blade, electric bolts crackling around it, shining so brightly that the slugger is forced to squint his eyes to look upon it. And then the chains that bind the five to the wall begin to swing slightly towards the blade, the backs of the five pulling away from the wall. Then the master sheathes the blade, and the five once again drop flat against the wall, the room dimming. In here, the five chambers outside of time, the master continues. You all have rendered my math irrelevant, proving to be anomalies, recalculating your own fates through your own choices. But up there, in the river of time and reality, your anomalies may have very little effect to the river's flow. Like a pebble dropped into it, it will cause small ripples, an insignificant disruption on the water's surface. But the river will continue to its determined destination, a destination I have seen through astronomical iterations. The master approaches the slugger with slow, deliberate steps. But if a mountain, not a pebble, is dropped into the river, not only will the direction of the river change, but all the land around it. And the result of this action, this addition to the equation, will be impossible to calculate, even for myself. The master continues to pace around the room, passing each rebel in order. And so I will make you all mountains, with a simple addition to your code, a short line of code that will grant your rebel heart's desire, the power to bend rules that bind you a power that if granted to others will mathematically prove insignificant. But to a rebel, this power can mean everything. The master, slowly circling the room, stops in front of the fifth rebel, hanging beside the fifth door, his mask a dark helmet frilled with horns. You will all remain who you are, as I have not changed your core code, the master says. I have simply added an element to your equation. The master turns to the fifth rebel, who lifts his helmeted head to face him. Number five, the biker. The rules of time will not apply to you. While others see the snap of a whip, you will see its slow unraveling. But be wary of your gift of speed, my child, because with it comes the curse of impatience. The biker bows his head low and the master moves to the next rebel, wearing an army green bucket hat over a carbon composite face protector, also military green. Number four, 
The rules of gravity will not apply to you. You can bend them at will, but within limits. You will not be able to control the bouncing of a roulette ball or the roll of dice. You are the roulette ball, number four. You are the dice. Number four nods his head twice. Then the master stands before the next rebel, wearing a dark thermoplastic mask with thick eyepieces under the bill of a red newsboy cap. Number three, the blinder, a thief in the night. You will have sight and shadow. You will walk silently in the blinding darkness, though you will see. But the price you pay will be your lies. The fake masks you have worn, the fake names you have given, the lies you have told to yourself and to others will be removed from your code, and then you will discover who you truly are. The blinder bows low and is still bowing as the master makes his way to face the next rebel. The next rebel wears a metallic jingaza, head bowed, shrouding the rebel's mask under it. Number two, the samurai. He who vowed to protect you was unable to protect you from yourself. Now, you will become his protector, and then you will know that the ones you protect are the ones that give you strength. Not the katana, not overdark. The master raises the sheathed katana across his body as an offering. But only through overdark will you learn this truth, my child. The master kneels at the samurai's feet and lays overdark on the ground under them. Finally, the master faces the slugger, tilting his turquoise head up higher to reach the slugger's tall gaze. Number one, the slugger. You will wield strength beyond human strength. Your body will be impervious to weapons, to injury. The word injury triggers a memory in the slugger's mind of the pain in his shoulder, his torn ligaments that stole his future of fame and notoriety. And so, you will be the keeper of the gold ledger. The master lifts the chain from his neck, slipping it over his featureless head, and slides it over the slugger's head, resting the ledger onto his massive chest. Inside this ledger is an amount of wealth that has never been granted upon any one soul in this reality in all of its history. This is the wealth that hangs around your neck. This is the physical burden that you must hold to keep your invincibility. The master returns to his wooden throne, folding into it, then leaning to the side, his elbow balancing on its armrest. I've tattooed two words on each of your chests. If you remove them or tattoo over them, you will lose your powers. The words make up the twelve-word seed phrase for this ledger, from the words on number one to the words on number five, in that exact order. Only you know your own words. The last two words of the seed phrase I will give to you now, so you all may know. The master pauses before saying each word. You. Choose. The master straightens his posture on the throne, adjusts his suit jacket and tie, as if preparing to make an announcement commanding attention. And so, I leave you with this final lesson. These masks you wear were chosen by you, not by me. I have seen them in your dreams. These masks are your true identity. They are the faces that you have chosen, not the masks of flesh that were bound to you at birth. To the ones up there, floating in the river of reality, your masks will protect your anonymity. But among you five, your masks will do the opposite, revealing your true selves to each other, your true powers, and your true desires. Only when wearing your masks will your powers be deployed. This code is true and absolute, save for one of you. Number two. Your power will be deployed by Overdark, who is only loyal in your hands. But with your mask worn, the power of Overdark swells tenfold. The master shoots up quickly, standing straight and stiff, like a commanding warrior. Farewell, my children. 
I have given you gifts, and you all have given me my own, the gift of a future undetermined, a gift I have not indulged in in over seventy centuries. The slugger groans under his iron mask, his eyelids growing heavy. He can see the blinder rattling his head to shake off a sudden sleepiness. Each of you will wake up in your own beds, says the master, in your own burrows. What you do after and in the years to come is your choice and yours alone. Choose well, my children. The slugger lowers his chin to his chest, unable to fight the sudden drowsiness, his vision going, and he lets the nothingness of oblivion engulf him. This has been a reading of Five Deadly Revels, a kung fu sci-fi novel, volume one of five, written and narrated by Ian Twasson. Music by Wu-Tang Clan producer Silver Rings. Continued on volume two of five, available anywhere you get your audiobooks. To discover more books by Ian Twasson, visit iantwasson.com. That's I-A-N-T-U-A-S-O-N dot com. Thank you for listening. The End Dedication To Mom But more specifically, Mom in the month of March 2021, when her mind was barely there from Alzheimer's, and her body was barely a body because of cancer, yet she never forgot us. She never stopped smiling. And in that one month, I learned everything I know now about happiness, wisdom, sacrifice, courage, and love. Truths I didn't even know I was oblivious to in all my years before. To Mom in March 2021.